Hi, thanks for tuning in. This is Golden Radiology High Yield Step 1 Review, Peds Respiratory. All of the content in our Step 1 videos is based on first aid for the USMLE Step 1, 2019 edition. So when I was taking Step 1, I found the newborn in distress vignette pretty intimidating since there are so many things that can be wrong. However, thankfully, only a few of them get tested on Step 1. So I think for our purposes, it's helpful to break down the etiologies into cardiac and palm. Once you recognize that it's pulmonary, there are actually only a few things that tend to show up on step one. Those are neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, diaphragmatic hernias, and neonatal pneumonias. For the other half of this chart, please check out our upcoming peds cardiology video. Okay, so let's get started with the question. Newborn premature baby with shortness of breath. What is the most likely diagnosis? Neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, pneumonia, pneumothorax, or diaphragmatic hernia. Okay, so this is neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, aka highland membrane disease, aka surfactant deficiency disorder, and it's caused by, you guessed it, too little surfactant. So surfactant production starts around 34 weeks. Babies born premature won't have enough surfactant, and as a result, the surface tension of their alveoli is high, and their lungs can't fully inflate. Okay, so instead of the normal black lucent lungs we see on chest radiographs, you're going to see a bunch of greeny white dots, and these actually represent collapsed alveoli. Some of the buzzwords you might hear on the exam are ground glass appearance or lung, low lung volumes. And then classically on pathology, there's going to be hyaline membranes within the alveoli. If you recall, the other disease where you classically get hyaline membranes in the alveoli is actually adult respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. So the risk factors for neonatal respiratory distress syndrome are prematurity, maternal diabetes, and cesarean section. So we already discussed why prematurity is a risk factor, but why are the other two risk factors? Well, for maternal diabetes, it's because insulin inhibits surfactant production. So when mom's glucose is really high, baby's going to have to make a lot of insulin to compensate for that. And that high amount of insulin is going to inhibit fetal surfactant production. The reason why cesarean section is a risk factor is because cortisol promotes surfactant production. So going through the vaginal canal uh, during delivery is actually a very stressful event for babies, and they produce quite a bit of cortisol during delivery. If you're born by cesarean section, that cortisol is never secreted, and so therefore you get less surfactant production. So one of the things you may get tested on is screening for fetal lung maturity. And we do that with the less than single myelin ratio in the amniotic fluid. A normal ratio is equal to or greater than two. And, some, and the number that makes you think NRDS is less than 1.5. So why does this make sense? Single myelin levels in amniotic fluid stay more or less constant throughout pregnancy. Lecithin is a major component of surfactant, and so as surfactant is produced and the lungs are maturing, the lecithin in the amniotic fluid should go up as well, and therefore that ratio should be increasing. Treatment is steroids for mom before birth, and then exogenous surfactant for baby after delivery. In addition, since these babies are going to have respiratory distress, they're going to have oxygen therapy and often be intubated and ventilated. Complications and associated issues are retinopathy of prematurity, intraventricular hemorrhage, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. The etiology of retinopathy of prematurity is unclear. It's historically been thought of as a response to oxygen therapy that these babies get in the NICU. The current thinking is that something happens that causes vasoconstriction of the premature retinal vessels. Then over time, as the retina becomes hypoxic from that vasoconstriction, you get expression of VEGF and overproliferation of vessels. Intraventricular hemorrhage, this is probably more a correlation than a complication, and that's because intraventricular hemorrhage is also associated with prematurity. And then bronchopulmonary dysplasia, this is a sequela of NRDS, and it's thought to be related to lung injury from being ventilated. These babies also have a high association of a patent ductus arteriosus, and that makes sense because anything that makes the baby hypoxic is going to delay closure of the ductus arteriosus. Okay, next question. Newborn baby with shortness of breath, what is the most likely diagnosis? A, neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, B, pneumonia, C, pneumothorax, or D, diaphragmatic hernia? Okay, so this one is congenital diaphragmatic hernia. If you look closely, you'll actually see that this is the orogastric tube, and it's actually going up into the left hemithorax. The stomach is usually 
right here below the diaphragm. So clearly something has happened to result in the stomach ending up in the left hemithorax. These hernias are typically left-sided and that's because the liver on the right has a protective effect. Congenital diaphragmatic hernias are associated with pulmonary hypoplasia and that's because the herniated bowel contents squish the adjacent lung and it therefore doesn't form properly. And then another cause of pulmonary hypoplasia you need to know, bilateral renal agenesis or Potter sequence. Okay, three-year-old with barking cough, inspiratory strider, and increased work of breathing. Most likely diagnosis. Croup, epiglottitis, strep pharyngitis, mumps parotitis, or foreign body aspiration. Okay, so this is croup. Croup is caused by parainfluenza virus, which is a paramyxovirus. It causes narrowing of the trachea and gives you this steeple appearance. It presents with a barking seal-like cough and inspiratory strider, and the treatment is racemic epinephrine and steroids. Okay, two-year-old unvaccinated female with fever and respiratory distress. She is leaning forward, tripoding, on examination. Most likely diagnosis. A, croup, B, epiglottitis, C, strep pharyngitis, D, mumps parotitis, or E, foreign body aspiration. Okay, so this was epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is inflammation and swelling of the epiglottis. Uh, and this is important because it actually can threaten the airway. It's caused by Haemophilus influenza type B, and you're going to classically see a cherry red or swollen epiglottis on direct visualization. Here we have the classic radiographic appearance, which is a thumbprint sign on the lateral radiograph. So a little bit about Haemophilus influenza. It's a gram-negative rod, and it comes in two types, capsulated or typable uh, H-flu and non-encapsulated, non-typable H-flu. The capsulated kind, there's quite a few capsules, but the only ones that we care about in medicine is the B capsule. And this is the one we actually have a vaccine for, the Hib vaccine. And the capsulated one is the one that causes meningitis and epiglottitis. I have a little asterisk here because uh, while doing research for this uh, video, I read that sometimes epiglottitis can be caused by non-typable H flu, but for USMLE step one, the encapsulated form causes meningitis and epiglottitis. The non-typable strain, uh, we don't have a vaccine for it, and it causes otitis media and pneumonia. So speaking of H flu and unvaccinated kids, let's take a moment to cross-train. When the question gives you a history of non-vaccination, they want you to think about these six diseases in addition to the ones caused by Haemophilus influenza type B. And they are polio, measles, rubella, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. So how will they hint that they want you to think about unvaccinated kids? Well, they might come right out and tell you that the kid is unvaccinated, or they'll give you a history of adoption, or say that the child immigrated from somewhere else, or say that the vaccination status is unknown. Now, when I took step one, vaccine hesitancy wasn't necessarily as big of an issue, but um, I can imagine that in the current climate that might come up. So tetanus. Tetanus is caused by Clostridium tetani, and classically, they're going to tell you that the patient stepped on a rusty nail. Just as a side note, if they tell you someone stepped on a nail specifically through the sole of a wet shoe, they're actually trying to get you to think of pseudomonas, not tetanus. The presentation of tetanus will be trismus or lockjaw, which is when you get spasms in the muscles of mastication and they clench down. You also get this rhesus sardonicus, which is a teeth-bearing grin that patients involuntarily have from that facial muscle spasm. And finally, you get opistotonus, which is pictured here in this painting and consists of severe spasms in the muscles and the severely curved back. Okay, and then of course you have polio. Polio is caused by the polio virus. And the presentation is going to be asymmetric weakness and hypotonia. You can also get flaccid paralysis and meningitis. Okay, and then measles. Measles is of course caused by the measles virus. Uh, classically, you'll get a cephalocaudal rash, which means you'll get a rash that starts from the head and moves downward. Um, they'll, show, they'll likely show you a picture of these coplic spots, which are these white little dots in the buccal mucosa. And they have, uh, before the rash breaks out, you get a prodrome of the three C's, cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. Rubella is caused by the rubella virus, and the presentation is going to be a little similar to measles in that you're going to also have a cephalocaudal rash. 
So something they might tell you to help you distinguish between rubella and measles is posterior auricular lymphadenopathy, or enlargement of the lymph nodes behind your ear. Then we have diphtheria. This is caused by Carinobacterium diphtheriae. The presentation is going to be fever, uh, and then very classically, they might even show this exact picture, is pseudomembranous pharyngitis. And so they'll say that you have these dirty white pseudomembranes in your uh, posterior pharynx. Uh, other issues that can arise are myocarditis and even arrhythmias. And then finally, we have pertussis, or whooping cough. Pertussis is caused by the bacteria Bordetella pertussis. The presentation will have two phases, the catarrhal phase, which is characterized by low-grade fever and chryza, and the paroxysmal phase, which is characterized by whooping cough and post vomiting in kids, and the so-called 100-day cough in adults. And this cough eventually goes away over time. Okay, guys, that's it. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.